You're listening to Standing Before the Mass podcast with Chris Heaton, sponsored by Newport Nautical Supply. Hi, folks. Welcome to the latest episode of the podcast. In this episode, I sit down with Wendy Mittman Clark. Wendy is a veteran writer and editor of sailing publications with a career that spans over 30 years. If you've ever picked up a copy of Soundings Magazine, Cruising World, or Good Old Boat, it's likely you've either read her work or something she's had a hand in editing. She's a recipient of many awards from the Boating Writers International and the Society of Professional Journalists. In addition to her writing, Wendy and her husband set off sailing for four years with their two young children and a dog who joined them in the last year of their trip. Wendy used that opportunity to weave their experiences with her career through a regular feature which appeared in Cruising World. That feature was called Osprey's Flight. In addition to sharing stories of their travels, she used that space to demystify some misconceptions about cruising and living aboard a boat with a family. In short, she offers us a dose of reality to go along with the dream. In our talk, Wendy shares many tips and lessons learned. We talk about everything from homeschooling and medical considerations to re-entering a land-based life after four years aboard. While we were fiddling with our audio and visual settings for our talk, we both discussed the potential for a dog to chime in at each of our respective homes, her in Maryland and me in Rhode Island. This triggered Wendy's memory of how they came to adopt their dog in Panama three years into their trip, and that's where our talk begins. You can learn more about Wendy and follow links to her writing and professional associations by visiting wendymittmanclark.com. That's W-E-N-D-Y-M-I-T-M-A-N-C-L-A-R-K-E.com. And I'll make sure to put a link in the text of the podcast bio. I hope you enjoy. Um, I have a good story about one of those dogs. It has to do with sailing. So, Oh, well, tell it. Okay. Uh, We were living on our boat Osprey uh, for four and a half years, cruising full time, my husband and our two kids and I. And we were living one winter down in uh, Cunayala in Panama. And my daughter, who had just turned 10, said she had seen this little dog on this uninhabited island that we were anchored next to. Uh, I kind of had seen it too, but I pretended that I didn't see it because I didn't want to know because, you know, we had sailed through um, a lot of Central America and uh, also some of the Eastern Caribbean. And we just seen uh, so many dogs that were just in terrible, terrible condition and street dogs and stuff. It was just hard as dog people. It was very hard to see. So I was trying to pretend that nothing was there, but she was insistent. I went in to see what you know, what was going on. And um, this little dog was hiding sort of in the sea grapes just behind the beach and she would run away and, and, uh, and then sort of lurk back. And so we started giving her fresh water and a little bit of rice, which was sort of all we had. And we'd go to this beach and hang out in the evenings for sundowners um, with friends. And she would, she would come in closer and closer all the time, but she would never stay and she would never get really close. And when I actually laid good eyes on her and realized that she was just a baby. She was just a puppy and she was all skin and bones and she was, you know, starving to death. Uh, I pretty much lost it. So we had this long conversation, my husband and I, like why, why taking a dog onto the boat is a terrible idea. We had had to, you know, we've always had dogs, but obviously we didn't bring them sailing with us, but I just couldn't stand to leave her there. So we went to talk to the chief of the island group um, to ask permission um, first to let him know if he knew about the dog and then to ask, you know, permission to, to adopt her if it was something we could do. And he was all about it, you know, said, yes, pl- good, good thing. Good idea. Um, so we ended up, my daughter worked days, weeks to, um, gain her trust. And one day it was like a light switch just went off. She just all of a sudden wouldn't leave my daughter's side. Uh, it was one of the most miraculous things I'd ever seen. I mean, she went literally went from like being afraid to being touched to letting my daughter pick her up and carry her down the beach. And so after that big transition happened within 48 hours, we lifted her into the dinghy and brought her out to the boat. And, and then she ended up sailing about 8,000 miles with us. Um, wow. 
Yeah, as it's she's the most amazing individual I've ever known. I mean, she's just an incredible dog, and um, she is now about eleven years old and still acts like a puppy. And she's my very best friend. And what kind of dog is she? she well, she's a she's a what would be known in the Bahamas as a pot cake. She's an island dog, you know. She's just sort of that sort of little brown dog, but she's really beautiful. She's got these huge radar shaped ears. And a lot of people who see her think she's a Basenji. Oh, wow. But she's not. We call her a Panamanian bushhound. And it was just a stray dog. Yeah, we had no idea how she got there. We, you know, we speculated uh, the native, the the Kuna people speculated, like the some of the Kuna family members said they thought that backpackers left her there. Mm-hmm. There's a, a lot of... Um, backpacking boat backpacker boats that travel through that part of Panama and they're taking people from uh like Cologne um over to Colombia and so a lot of these young backpackers will hop on these boats and and cruise through there and so the the Kuna said they thought that either cru- some cruiser did it or a backpacker did it and the cruisers all said they thought the Kuna did it but I don't know how she ended up there all alone she was the only you know, it wasn't a tiny island. It was a pretty big island. She was able to survive on it, but she was clearly, I have no idea how she ended up there. I still don't know. Was there any way to get a sort of a medical or a vet checkup to get an assessment before you got her on board? No. So there, so that was part of the conversation, you know, I was like, well, how do we know that she's not sick with something like, you know, heartworm or rabies? She didn't look unhealthy other than being really skinny. Her teeth were super clean. You know, her coat was even quite clean. Mm. Um, so what we ended up doing was we knew we had to get her rabies vaccinated. So we asked around in the cruisers community and found out there was a veterinarian in a town called Portobello, which was about 60 miles to the west toward the canal. So we took off for Portobello and found the vet there. He was a Korean vet living in Panama, who thankfully spoke English. And, you know, we went to the local cruisers bar and they said, oh yeah, you got to go see Dr. So-and-so. He's, his shop's right there. He should be there around three in the afternoon. And that's exactly what happened. We just walked in with this, you know, puppy in our arms. And so he looked her over. He said, she looked like she was in great shape, all things considered. She wasn't sick at all. We think that one of the reasons she was so healthy was because she was on the island. There, the wind, you know, the the wind blows pretty steadily there. We never had any mosquito issues. So it wasn't like she was going to pick up any kind of mosquito borne illness. There were no other mammals there that we could find. So she wasn't going to pick up something from another mammal. Mm. So he vaccinated her. He gave her her first rabies vaccination and started, and he filled out a vaccination record card for her and told us when we should revaccinate her so that she'd have the full. Um, suite of vaccinations and you could buy the vaccinations in the pet stores in Cologne. Mm -hmm. So after we left him, we went and bought her vaccinations and then we just gave them to her on the dates that he had marked. And that was that. Most of the cruisers I've encountered, I don't recall them having dogs, but sometimes they'd have a cat. And I did read one of your, one of your articles that was linked off of your website that talked about some of the practical things about having a dog on board, uh, especially when you're offshore, which was uh, not so much the eating, but the output. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It became a pretty stressful thing for uh, for me, at least watching her, you know, hold it, <laughs> <laughs> which she would do for a long time. Um, she would also start to limit what she would drink and eat. And that's what I was more worried about was she was limiting her water intake. When right. we but after a while, you know, usually it was like 48 hours and then she'd kind of kick into gear and it was never easy for her when we were offshore but she adapted incredibly well and it the but the there was one trip I remember in particular the logbook just became like this every entry was about whether she had or hadn't you know <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny if it were ever reviewed by somebody I know <laughs> how far into your cruise now you're off sailing for four years with your family how far into that did did you find the dog she was her third year. Oh, okay. So quite near the end. You know, it's a funny thing. I, we had always had dogs. 
my brother took one of our dogs before we left and a friend took the other. We had two two left in the family and there was no way they were coming on the boat. I mean, they were both older, big, furry mm-hmm. dogs, you know, and it wasn't going to work. Um, so to, to give them up was actually one of the hardest things about leaving. <laughs> and I hadn't realized how much I had missed having a dog in my life um, until she came to live with us on the boat. And then it was just like, God, it was amazing. She, you know, she's, it's that whole kind of unconditional love thing. And, and also she just became a, I don't know, she was just so much fun, you know, and she, she diffused a lot of, if there was any tension or stress, she would diffuse a lot of it just by being who she was. Mm. Um, So she was, she was a real miracle. I thought. Let's go back. How did you get into writing for the marine industry or for the boating population? Go all the way back. Okay. Well, the roots of that are from when I was a little kid and um, my parent, my dad used to always get soundings. Mm -hmm. And so it was always in our house and I always saw it. And also, um, you know, I was on the water from when I was a little kid uh, on the Chesapeake Bay. And so... I ended up going to, you know, I ended up going to college. I ended up uh, getting out of college and going to work for newspapers and then the Associated Press. And so I was working for the AP for about three and a half years up in northern New England. And I got pretty burned out and was ready to switch jobs. And I also was ready to go back to the Chesapeake because I'd been in northern New England for probably about eight years at that point between school and work. And I was kind of homesick. And so I saw this, uh, you know, ad in a magazine. That's how we used to get jobs. You know, we'd look like (laughs) we'd look in magazines and newspapers uh, for soundings, looking for an editor in um, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, I applied for jobs like really high end, you know, high intensity newspaper jobs like at the Hartford Current and stuff. I also applied for this job at Soundings thinking there's no way they're going to want a wire service reporter. I mean, you know, it's crazy. Nor was I convinced that it was what I wanted to do. You know, it was a pretty hard left turn out of kind of mainstream traditional journalism where I've been working. But anyway, the the editor at the time was an ex-newspaper person and she was all about it. And it just so happened that person who ran their Mid-Atlantic Bureau had been let go and they wanted to fill that position. And so they not only offered me the job making as much as I was making at the AP, but they also offered me a chance to go run a bureau where exactly where I wanted to be, which wow. was Annapolis. Wow, that's fortunate. And yeah, so that's how I started working in you know, and what, what year would this been? Let me see now. But I think I moved to Annapolis in, in 86 or somewhere around there. Were you still there? The only reason I ask, were you still there in 1996, perhaps? Oh, yeah. You no, were. It was later than that. I think it was 89, to tell you the truth. Okay. The only reason I ask, my dad and I opened our business in 1992. And in 1996, a writer by the name of Tim Stanton did a little story about us. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of funny because like a year before they had filmed the movie True Lies with Arnold Schwarzenegger here in Newport. And just by some weird coincidence, we sold a lot of things of new and used to the to the set guys. And so they they wrote an article. Tim wrote an article and he included a bit of that. When the article came out, I was I was frightened because we never dealt with you know, any big league person at at the film, it it was the set guys and the sort of uh, props people. But when the article came out, this is what the editor... Even Arnold Schwarzenegger shots here. Oh boy, but it was a heck of a shot in the arm considering that we were only two or three years old and then Boat US and West Marine moved in across the street. I remember mentioning this to a friend who still works for a local newspaper and he said, oh, the writer didn't write that headline. That's One true. of the editors did. <laughs> exactly. Yep, that's true. The writers generally don't write the, the headlines. And oftentimes, particularly nowadays, um, when the headlines are such, you know, really written for clickbait, mm. um, sometimes the headlines that get stuck on your stories make you shudder. Um, oh, right. Because they're just so, <laughs> you know, their intentions are clearly not maybe what you wanted them to be. Yeah, so that was 1989. That's um, that's when I came to Annapolis, and um, I worked for Soundings for uh, many years, um, till 1998, and then I went to work for Chesapeake Bay Magazine, and eventually became executive editor there. 
which was a really pretty cool f- full circle for me because I had first submitted a story to Chesapeake Bay Magazine when I was 15 and I was very politely declined. So it was pretty cool to become, you know, part of that staff and part of that magazine at that time. It was a really exciting time to be at that magazine. There was a lot going on. And But I'm not familiar with that. Is boating the focus of that or is it completely different? It, it was then. Yeah, it was mm. it was a regional, you know, Chesapeake Bay regional magazine with boating as its primary focus. And so it was just amazing, you know, both soundings and Chesapeake Bay. I mean, I was constantly pinching myself because no matter what I was doing on the water was like my job. Wow. And so it was just fun, you know, I mean, I would go racing and then I could go write about it or I'd find a cool story out of it or, um, and then Chesapeake Bay was also did a lot of cultural and historical stories, which I really wanted to start doing. So that's one of the reasons I made that transition over to them is I sort of wanted to broaden out the the sort of types of stories I could write. Yeah. So it was just a great career. I mean, it was a lot of fun. Did you work for Cruising World as well? Um, Yes, but I was never staffed with them. Um, When uh, we were getting ready to go on our trip, Bernadette Burnin had had the back column of Cruising World Log of Ithaca for many, many years. I read it all the time. And as I read the rest of Cruising World, and I saw that they were um, coming back to land and the column was going to close down. And so I actually approached John Burnham at the time and said, you need a columnist. And uh, and I also said, you know, Cruising World up at the, to that point hadn't done very much about families cruising. So mm-hmm. that's kind of how I pitched the idea, you know, this would be a column about a family doing this. So that's when I started writing that column for Cruising World um, called Osprey's Flight. And that lasted for, geez, something like five years. Mm. I, I clicked a few of those off your website because I probably hadn't seen them at the time they were out. I really enjoyed them. And the style of your writing is such that you engage the reader in what you're going through, which I thought you, you don't see a lot of in in boating journalism. And I just your observation, I think a few of the ones that stood out were observing your son basically become a young man, handling his own watch offshore and just that that sort of teenage transformation that most people witness with their kids on the soccer field or what whatever and, and in domestic life, you witnessed it offshore. And yeah. and you shared that with us, the the reader. Yeah. Um I also wanted to demystify and debunk some of it, um, because I felt like it wasn't as easy as everybody seemed to make it look. Some of those columns I kind of talk about when I was having my doubts about these choices we had made, you know, um, whether it really was a great thing to do. There were times when it wasn't very easy, you know, so I wanted to let people, I wanted to write about that too, to let people know that I felt that sometimes it was harder than it looked because when we left, remember like Facebook was just starting to be a thing. I mean, there were no Facebook pages like Women Who Sail or any of these, you know, big, big pages like that and groups like that. So I didn't have that kind of network. Um, Mm. I didn't have a bunch of people to talk with, nor was I on the internet. I mean, most of the time when we were sailing, you know, some of the places we'd live, like in Panama, you, you, there was zero internet. You had to go sail to one particular island that had one router that was powered by um, a couple little solar panels and you you plugged in, you downloaded all your banking information, you know, you, you got all the vital stuff you needed to get and then you left. Right. You checked your email and then you left. You, there was no hanging around on the internet. It's changed now. But at that time, you know, I felt like I was kind of on my own in a lot of ways. I figured that there were other people who felt that way. And in fact, I met some people who felt that way. So I knew that there was something to be said there about, you know, yeah, this is amazing and wonderful and I wouldn't trade it, but there are some parts of it that are kind of difficult. So I tried to express that a little bit in in those columns too. Mm. And today, most of the access to what you see people posting on Instagram or Facebook, it makes it look quite glamorous, but most people I know that have done any extensive offshore sailing could tell you quite the opposite. Yeah, or cruising full-time. There is no doubt that it you get to see things that other people don't get to see. You get to go places. You get to do things that are extraordinary, but you work your butt off to do it. You know, the boat is constantly under wear and tear. In my case, because my husband's so good at, at that kind of work, there was constantly something that needed to be dealt with. Uh, for a lot of people, that gets overwhelming. So 
It is terrific. It's wonderful. Yes, sometimes, you know, you just sit there and you can't believe you're this lucky, but there's a lot of hard work that goes into that. And there's an awful lot of hard work that goes into just getting there. Mm. Sometimes when sometimes when I watch the vlogs and stuff and videos that everybody's watching today, I kind of get that feeling like, yeah, it just isn't this perfect, you know? <laughs> how, how long was the, the ramp up to your, your departure for your four-year trip? Was it something you'd planned a long time or was it the result of a redundancy in one of your jobs? Well, my husband and I, from the moment we met, talked about going sailing together long term. Mm-hmm. So that was a, a long-term dream. We decided we wanted to do it with our kids rather than wait till we were, you know, the kids were gone. Uh, then we started plotting it around kind of the best the best timing we felt for that. Mm-hmm. We got our boat in 2000, I think the fall of 2006. I'm trying to remember the timeline. We We got her, we spent a summer going up to New England, just sort of shaking her down as is to see what we wanted to change. Um, and then that whole winter, uh, we made the changes and not just that winter, that's winter, spring, summer. And then we left in the fall of 2008. So, I mean, it was basically a year and a half to two years with the boat, getting it ready. But the bigger picture was that it was something that we had been thinking toward for a very long time. Mm. And how did you find back to the, the kids, the homeschooling aspect of it, was that something you, you planned ahead for or you had some some sort of counseling on? <laughs> the homeschooling was, was the hardest part. We knew we weren't teachers. We were very concerned that they got education that you know we felt they needed in case we were going to come back to the States, in case they, need, they were going to come back to the education as we know it in the States. We wanted to make sure they were on, on level. So we ended up um, using Calvert curriculum out of the Calvert School in Baltimore, which is a is a very well known correspondence curriculum at the time. Now it's a lot of it's done online now, but then you know you would still you would order like the grade level seven, and it came in a box. All the books, <laughs> it literally was kind of cool. It came, I mean, all the books came in the box: notebooks, paper, pencils, everything. Wow! And every day, the course schedule was laid out for you. So the first year we did this, we were so nervous about it that we were like trying so hard to to adhere to what they felt we should do that it became really burdensome. Um, As time went on, we sort of realized, you know, I don't care if my kid knows how to diagram a sentence or not. I think we can let go of that part. You know, we... (laughs) Says the writer. Yeah. Well, there were certain aspects of the curriculum that we just felt we could let go of, which was fine in the long run. And the first year, you know, they would do their tests and we would mail them in and an independent grader would grade them. And that's part of the way that, you know, Calvert School maintains credits that are transferable back into the public school system because they document, you know, what the kids are learning. The hardest part about homeschool, because we aren't teachers by profession, was changing the hats. And this was both for the kids and us because, you know, like we you put the teacher hat on and the kids had to put the student hat on and Mm -hmm. it didn't always work well in the beginning. Over time it worked fine, but in the beginning it was a very difficult transition to make because, you know, kids and parents necessarily that, you know, that's not the best relationship for that kind of thing. So Mm. we had a lot of stress in the beginning about it. It got better over time, but yeah, um, homeschooling was a big deal, very big deal. And how much time, a day and how did you sort of structure it? I imagine it would be difficult in a tropical environment to want to sit down with a book when it's 80 degrees outside and the waters are beautiful. You're, you are correct. Um, <laughs> oh, a bird, <laughs> oh, a fish. <laughs> we would start school at nine in the morning and we would go until that day's lessons were done, which sometimes was three hours as they got older and the, and stuff got more involved. It sometimes mm-hmm. went as long as six hours. and. The downside to that was, yes, there was a lot of stuff we that, you know, like friends of ours who didn't have kids that we were sailing with would be like, hey, you know, we're going to go off and go snorkel this reef or we're going to go do this hike. You want to come? And we'd say, no, we can't. We got to do school. The upside to it was that you focused real hard for those hours and then you were done. There's no homework. Whenever school was done, it was like, OK, let's go have fun now. Let's go swimming. Let's go snorkeling. Let's go hiking. And 
so there was a, you know, upside and a downside to it. I mean, definitely there were times it was frustrating and you just wanted to go play. One of the really cool things that happened in our last year, we went back to Georgetown in our final winter because the kids really, you know, we asked them, what do you want to do? This is probably our last winter. What do you want to do? And they said, we want to go be around more kids. We said, okay, well, you know, you know, you know where we're going then. We sailed back to Georgetown and we hung out, which, you know, we hadn't done. Like we moved a lot, you know, so we really hung out and we made great friends. And we had like this core group of about four to five cruising families that did all this fun stuff together. And one day, one of the parents got this great idea of let's have field day because, you know, when you're in regular school, you get field day and it was always so much fun to have field day. So we had field day up in the Abacos. We basically took the whole day off and we all went out to this beach and we came up with all these goofy things to do. And it was one of the most fun days of all. It was really, really fun. So I imagine that would be a big thing for a, a kid or a teenager even to have someone to socialize with that's among their peer group. And that doesn't sound like there's a lot. Well, you mentioned four to five cruising families. It, uh, there are a lot of people out there cruising with young kids on board. At the time we were out, I didn't feel like there were a lot, mm -hmm. but there's also sort of places you can go to find them. And, and there's some, you know, decisions you have to make. Like if we had just hung around in Georgetown all the time, we would have met a lot more families, but we didn't want to just sit in one place. And we ended up cruising with um, a couple of families over the course of time that we're still very, you know, great friends with. But yes, one of the great advantages to being a cruising kid is that they're very, you know, the barriers are are low. Like it's like you meet a cruising kid or you meet a cruising family and the kids are like, Hey, let's go do fun things. Mm. You know, there's not a whole lot of dancing around it. They connected very quickly because they had this very shared experience. And so when you did meet up with other families, that happened usually pretty quickly. It was pretty cool. Yeah. I have a friend who's a, he was a retired, he's a retired naval aviator. And I hope to catch up with him on this podcast. When he left the military, he and his wife bought a cruising catamaran instead of a house, or they sold their house, and they went south down to the islands. And with the pandemic hit, he did not return to the U.S. They went one shot from Grenada to Panama, and they transited the canal, and I guess they're working their way up the Sea of Cortez, and put up a few videos on, on YouTube, and I'm sort of following them. And one of the things that he said made it fun was that they transited the canal, uh, rafted up to another cruising catamaran with a family who they had met elsewhere prior. And it made it fun for everybody, the kids. Um, it gave a, a level of comfort for him, I think, for transiting the canal, because I think these folks had done it before. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a big thing. You know, one of the things that people don't talk a lot about with cruising is that it's not actually, for a lot of couples or families, a, typically a very natural environment. I mean, you know, you're, you're squeezing your whole family into a pretty small space, or even if you're a couple. If you think about like how couples normally live their lives, you know, you have a job, your spouse has a job, you split up during the day, you go do your job, you come together in the evening, eat dinner, whatever. You're not generally together 24-7, unless there's a pandemic. And a lot of, <laughs> that can be a crucible. I mean, you know, a lot of people don't want to hang out that much. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, when you, when you, when you meet into, you know, you meet other people, you run into other people and you're like-minded and you get along well, it's great. Mm. Cause you're like, Oh God, thank God. You know, somebody I can go walk on the beach with besides this guy. <laughs> um, it's important. You know, it's important. I, I think I saw an internet little meme or something about, uh, you know, cruising people on boats and living in close quarters in reference to the pandemic and people on land being stressed out, the cruisers were like, hold my beer. You know, yeah, I've yeah. done this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and very much, I felt that way right, right away. Uh, I felt that way, you know, when everybody was freaking out about food, I was like, well, our pantry is already basically a cruising <laughs> pantry, you know, cause that's right. how I think now, you know, being, being at home full time with my family was actually a real joy. It was something unexpected. Uh, you know, at this point in our lives, we didn't expect to all be together again this way. And so to me, it's sort of like the circumstances are terrible, but I think as a cruising family, it's been a lot easier for us to make that transition than someone who's never done this before. 
one of the things I I read that you a link off your website was uh you had written about Bert her heart mm-hmm. am, I saying, am i saying that correctly mm-hmm. that's a fascinating experience on its own but then to have it take place amongst this pandemic yeah you know? Bert would be a great person for you to interview he's very uh very good uh fun to talk to uh um, i'd not i'd not heard of him until i i saw that link and of course i read i read your story what a what a fascinating tale yeah he's an he's uh he's a really interesting guy very intense but you know great sense of humor and just amazing thing he's done. But, you know, the other thing that, that I learned when we were sailing, and I learned it particularly when we were in Panama, because we, we went to Cologne and hung out there for a while and helped friends of ours transit through the canal. So we were sort of hanging around and it's a real crossroads for sailors, obviously, for obvious reasons. So you start to talk to a lot of people. There are so many people doing this stuff. I mean, there's so many people who are sailing around the world and nobody knows about it. Mm. You know, there's, it's not being covered. It's, it's, they don't make a big hoopla out of it. They just right. do it and they do it over and over again. And so, yes, what Bert did was astonishing and amazing um, and not anything I could ever conceive of doing. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, you know, I just admire a, a lot of these people who are, are just out there quietly doing it and have been for many, many years. And I suspect things have been pretty hard for them for the last year. Because yeah. of, you know restrictions on where they can can go or not go. Yeah, I think my my friend who was, went through the canal, I think his original plan was to just return to New England in, in the summer uh, last summer. And obviously, with the pandemic, they rethought everything. Yeah, of course. What were some of the medical considerations? Did you plan for before you set out? Yeah, we're not doctors either, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> I would love it if I could sail with a doctor <laughs> or a nurse. So we got a one of the medical CPAC kits that you can mm-hmm. buy. And then we sat down with our GP who came over to our house one day and she said, okay, she went through the whole thing with us. And she said, okay, I think, you know, in addition to this, you ought to get this, 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 and this. Right. And she basically prepped us as best she felt, you know, we needed to be prepped in terms of medications and stuff. Um, in retrospect, I would have taken all those prescriptions she wrote and waited till we got to the Dominican Republic and bought them there because they cost a fraction of what they cost in the States. Mm. But anyway, we had them and fortunately we barely had to use them. I mean, we did have, I think, you know, the worst thing that happened medically was my, my husband um, contracted dengue fever in Guatemala, uh, which was really pretty ugly. And, you know, and we had some recurring ear infections in Panama. But when I think back about all the things that we did, that we would just do routinely, you know, the sort of just some of the hikes we did and some of the swimming we did and some of the stuff we did routinely, I'm kind of amazed that that we were as unscathed as we were. So I'm grateful for that. No, but yeah, nobody gets but our But our doctor, I mean, this is one of the cool things about her. She, she's amazing. And she gave her us her email address. And she said, if you ever get into trouble, if you ever have a question, just email me. And I did that about four times. And each time she got back to me, you know, within 12, 12 to 20 hours and right away was there for me. And I think now, you know, you can, uh, there are ways you can do something similar um, with sort of doctors on call. But at that time, this was pretty extraordinary above and beyond for her to do that. Mm. Um, And she's actually retiring at the end of April and we're all kind of sad because she's been our GP since our kids were born and I need to write her a letter because you know knowing that she was there was uh, was very comforting. How about the transition when you mentioned I think it was your kids that sort of said we they wanted to go back was that right? We kind of we knew that you know we had probably a year we could have stayed out more maybe eight months more but um, yeah they were expressing a desire to see what the quote unquote real world is like, (laughs) socially speaking. And we were also concerned about our ability to get jobs, you know, when we got back. And so we gave, you know, gave ourselves a little extra runway. So yeah, it was kind of a mutual, you know, mutual decision. Um, Was it a shock to anyone's system when you returned or? Yes. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, um, everything's a trade-off and, I still miss being on the boat. I mean, I miss being connected to the um, natural world all the time, like all the time. As soon Mm. as we moved into a house, I knew 
everything would change. You know, once you have a roof over your head, you just don't go outside as much anymore. You just aren't as dialed in as you, as you have to be when you're living on a boat. And I, as, as stressful as that could be sometimes, um, you know, it was also just, I just loved it. So I, I, I still really miss that. And, you know, I think any big transition like that is, even if you're ready for it, you know, it's, it's strange. It's hard. Is your plan to go out again or are you going, are you land-based now? I know that I want to go out again, but I don't want to go out full time again. Mm. Like I would like to be able to take off for half a year, you know, maybe. I, I don't think that we actually at this point want to, you know, dump everything and go full time again the way we did. We want to do other traveling. We really want to, um, my husband and I want to do other stuff. You know, we want to do a lot of different kinds of traveling when we can again. So there's a lot of land we haven't seen. <laughs> right. Um, um, and I still really want to go. I do still want to go to the Sea of Cortez. I want to go out to, you know, places like that. I'd love to do it on a boat. When we were fumbling around with our settings at the beginning of this, before I started recording, you had asked me how I found you. And I just remembered, for some reason, somebody started dropping off a good old boat magazine, which has changed format since I remember it, mm -hmm. at our store, I guess is a freebie. It's a stack just appears and they unwrap it. The customers are picking them up and reading them, as am I, and bringing it home. And and that's where I saw your name and it triggered and I said I remember that name from soundings and other things. So you're you're back with them or you're 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 with them. Yeah, um, I got a phone call back in June of 2019 from uh, Michael Robertson, who's the editor, and he he and I had met years before. I was writing a story for Cruising World at the Annapolis Boat Show, and he was uh, among the, at the time they had these. Uh, what did they call them? They were like citizen judges for boat of the year. You know, they were like regular boaters. They would gather several of these people who would who would go around and check out the boats and then render their opinions. So I met Michael there, and then I knew that he had he had gone cruising with his family. Anyway, I mean, I didn't make the Good Old Boat connection, but he had taken on. You know, he had become editor of Good Old Boat, and he called me in 2019 saying that their longtime beloved senior editor Jeremy McGeary had to retire because he was mm -hmm. ill and would I consider becoming senior editor of the magazine at the time, you know, I was already trying to figure out how to become independent again in terms of my career. And I'm a big believer in when you start, when you point yourself in the right direction, the universe will tell you by opening doors for you. And this was a big open door. And I said, yeah, absolutely. I definitely want to do it. Mm. So since then I've, I just love it. I mean, I love the magazine. I love the team. We're very small, but we are mighty. <laughs> um, you know, it's just really fun, dynamic people. And the writers are, you know, predominantly our readers. And it's a, just a gigantic range of people on boats. Everybody, you know, people who their idea of the best kind of sailing is, you know, through their little club up on a lake in Canada or the Great Lakes mm. and all the way to people like, you know, Bert Terhart who's an ocean navigator. So an ocean sailor. And so it's just a, it's just a lot of fun. Um, I'm learning a ton. I, I always, you know, I always thought that I knew a lot and then I find out I don't know anything and, and that's <laughs> really fun. And it's I like fun, the and vibe of that magazine. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. It, it's just, um, it's almost all content. I mean, it, you know, of all the magazines, you just get a ton out of it every time you pick it up. And I'm constantly finding out cool things that, that our readers have done or cool ideas they've come up with or a way to solve a problem or, um, you know, that they're just brilliant. And it's just a lot of fun to be part of that and to be always learning something new. So yeah, I love it. Uh, Boating Writers International had their, uh, their annual awards in February and good old boat earned 13 awards, which wow. was actually more than any other publication. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I was thrilled because I've, feel like we've really worked hard in the last year. You know, we changed the design about the same time I came on. We had a new designer come on. We've worked really hard to change the design, to keep it true to what it is, but to update it. You know, we've worked, worked hard to keep the content true to what it is, but more, you know, just, we've just worked real hard. And it was very gratifying to have our peers recognize that um, at that contest. So that was really exciting. There seems to be, a, you have a lot of editorial control. I'm guessing that it's not owned by a large media conglomerate. One of the things I love most about it is it's owned by 
a wonderful woman named Carla Sandness. And, you know, it was started by two people in their basement. Um, it's always been kind of feisty and small. And it, yes, in terms of editorial independence, it, it has all of it, uh, which is important to me. It's hard to get these days, you know. Mm. It's hard to be a magazine today. You mentioned Jeremy McGeary earlier. I, I didn't know he was ill. It's funny, the intersections here. One of my earlier interviews was with Anna Vanderwall. Mm -hmm. And a, probably in the late 90s, Jeremy was at Cruising World. And they were doing a, an article about sail trim. And they, they were desperately looking for, it was early spring. They were desperately looking for a boat that was in the water. And my dad's happened to be in the water. So we quickly rigged it. And they had hired Anna to do the photo shoot for the magazine. And Jeremy came aboard and there were a couple other people and we went out sailing off of Castle Hill and they took shots of, of whatever they're talking about, twist in the, in the head sail and stuff like that. And we got out there and it was, it was a nice day for early April. And the first thing Anna shouts over, and I, we talked about this, I don't know if it made it into my podcast, but we, he shouts over, where are the battens? <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> in my rush to get the boat rigged, you forgot um, the battens. I forgot to put the battens in the main, <laughs> so I think we dropped the mainsail, scrambled quickly, bodged them in, uh, main back up, and then we, they were able to basically play with the uh, the Genoa car to, to either incite twists so they could show what was a bad setting and then do it correctly. Mm -hmm. um, it was a fun day. Yeah, yeah. Good old boat is is a real. Um, I can't say enough good about it. I really, I'm I'm very excited to be part of it. It's just uh, been a really great thing for me to work on. And and then in my other part of my life, I'm a science writer for Maryland Sea Grant College. So I'm mm. half, of, half of my time I'm writing about science in terms of the Chesapeake Bay and Maryland and marine science, um, not marine science, but you know science and research about the Chesapeake Bay. And then the other half of my time I'm working on boats. So it's just this perfect balance of my two favorite things. You've written for Motor Boating Magazine as well, correct? Yeah, I freelanced throughout my career. I have freelanced for a lot of people. Uh, even when I was staff with magazines like Chesapeake Bay Magazine, I was always really worried even way back in the beginning when I switched from the AP to soundings, I was worried that I would kind of get pigeonholed as a boating writer. And I didn't want to lose my my skills and my ability to be a general assignment writer. I also just loved general assignment writing because you just never know what you're going to get to write about, which is one of the cool things about being a writer. Mm. So, so I was freelancing a lot on the side. Um, I freelanced for Smithsonian Magazine for a time. Up to a couple of years ago, I was Smithsonian. I was freelancing for Smithsonian Online, writing science pieces for them. All the while, I've been working as a freelancer for other publications, and so now I'm freelancing for Soundings again, which I love because um, that's another great team of people um, mm. and a great. All these years, you know, Soundings has just been a rock solid publication, just with terrific writers and editors. Um, and so I'm really happy to be part of that team too, as a freelancer and cruising world as well. Um, you know, I, I still freelance for them now and then, um, even though I'm not out there anymore. And again, you know, they're also just a terrific team of people. So yeah, I've done, you know, I've written a lot of stuff. The, the one I, I saw for motor boating magazine was about Coast Guard rescue swimmers, which was one of the coolest stories I'd ever done. I wanted yeah. to, I wanted to write, um, actually wanted to write a story f about them for Smithsonian, but the editor didn't go for it, which hmm. kind of blew my mind at the time. And then shortly thereafter, the Perfect Storm was published, and then everybody wanted to write about rescue swimmers after that. But yeah, motorboating sent me down to uh, the rescue swimmer school in Elizabeth City, mm -hmm. and um, I spent a couple of days there, and that was intense. It was. They gave me terrific access. It was really, really amazing to watch. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. And having been a gigantic fan of the Coast Guard my whole life, uh, you know, it was a real honor to be able to to watch those those young men. They were all men in that class, although there are def there are definitely women rescue swimmers. Just to watch how hard they had to work and and watch the training and well, the it, whole story about that you know that program and how it began is is pretty fascinating and um, the casualty that basically started the rescue swimmers happened right off of the Virginia coast, mm. um, the sinking of the Marine electric. And I remember that. I mean, I remember when that happened, it was huge, big story and 
just a terrible tragedy. And the, the worst part of it was that the Coast Guard circling above the wreck could see the people in the water, but and they could lower baskets to them, but the people were so hypothermic, they couldn't get in the baskets and they would just die. And they had to call on the Navy rescue swimmer to come. I think there were two Navy rescue swimmers, maybe only one, can't quite remember exactly. But anyway, because the Navy was the only, they were the only ones that had designated swimmers at that point. And mm. it was that incident that uh, at that point, the Coast Guard said, okay, we're going to have our own rescue swimmers. And that's when they started the program. And I remember reading your article, being surprised at how recent it was. I, yeah, it was the 80s. I operated in the, uh, under the assumption that this program had been part of the Coast Guard for a long time. No, I think the Marine Electric happened in the early 80s. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we talked a little bit about Good Old Boat and, and how that publication is, is different from some of the more traditional ones. What's your perspective on how the world of publishing is changing? And do you see for printed matters, you think that's the way to go? Do you mean, do I think magazines in print will stay around? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. It, will they stay around? And if they do, is it is it the good old boat type of format versus mm. a, a more glossy? I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't know about the answer to the, that question exactly. I do know that, yeah, obviously things have changed so much uh, in just in the last 10 years, but certainly the last 20 years in terms of magazines and and the internet and where most people are getting their information now. I find, and this is probably you know going to age me, uh, one of the things that I appreciate about a magazine like Cruising World, like Good Old Boat, like Soundings, is that there is a team of editors in those places who has sort of got their eyes and ears out in the world and they're looking for, you know, they're aggregating. They're basically saying, hey, this could be a good story. Hey, this is an interesting story. Mm. And they're and they're to some degree, you know, helping funnel <laughs> just the chaos of and I use the word chaos, maybe that's not right, but sometimes it feels like chaos to me where like, I'll try to get a piece of information off the internet and it's just, I'm just flooded with so much information that it's almost like overwhelming to me. I think that magazines similar to books give people a particular uh, opportunity for a particular voice that maybe they don't get on a blog or mm -hmm. in a vlog, or, you know, in those formats and on those platforms. And I am one of those old school people who loves to read with something in my hands. I mean, right. I love to open a book and I love to open a magazine. There are a couple fantastic magazines that I love about marine science that are, that are um, digital only. And as much as I love them, I still put them away. I still, you know, want to sit down at the end of the day with a book or a magazine. And I think that's part of my generation. So how it's all going to change in the next 10 years, I probably don't want to think about. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I think there's huge value still in print. I, I believe you're starting, you know, magazines, regional magazines like Points East, like Spin Sheet, like Latitudes and Attitudes. I mean, they they have a devoted following. Is that still going? Latitudes? Oh, heck yeah. Oh, okay. You Is know, that the one I'm thinking of? There was a, the guy who founded it was the former publisher of like a biker magazine? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I didn't know that was still going. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, these regional publications have a devoted following, people who are really involved in them, and they're very much parts of their communities. And, you know, to some extent, I think there's a parallel between them and like a local newspaper. You know, it's they're, they're about the community. And mm. that's super important. So I certainly feel like as a writer, it's become a lot harder for young writers. I mean, to some extent, Blogs and vlogging and all that gives people enormous access and enormous opportunity to get their voices out there that mm. they might not otherwise be able to do. So that's a benefit. But the flip side to that is that if you're a young writer, particularly now, trying to get into a more mainstream magazine, like let's just say something like Outside, mm. you know, something like that, it's going to be hard it's harder. Like most things, it's a compromise. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of benefit to sort of the, the media world as it is now, but there's also, there's some downsides. I don't think I answered that question. I'm not sure. No, I, I'm not yeah, sure I know how to answer that question. Well, it's, I think it's evolving. 
It, yeah. And that's that that's the answer. <laughs> yeah, I think as a magazine, you have to cover all the bases, you know, your website has to be great, you have to have video content that's engaging, you have to have, um, you know, storytelling that's engaging. One of the things that I'm doing at Maryland Sea Grant right now that I absolutely love is visual storytelling through what's called ArcGIS story maps, which is a way of presenting a story that is much more interactive than just text. And even just text and photos. It's totally fun to work in. Um, really exciting. Makes you think about the story in a completely different way. I would love to see some, you know, online maritime formats going in that direction. I would love to think that, you know, um, that magazines will continue to be able to be in print because I think there's a real value in it. But I know it's a difficult, you know, road to, to walk right now. And I imagine that for some publications, it, it's got to be a difficult line to walk. There's got to be a sort of a firewall between someone, say, reviewing a boat for boat of the year and then the advertising department. Uh, I mean, you want, you've got to walk some kind of line there. Yeah, it's always complicated. That's yeah. always complicated. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. I, I appreciate your time. I don't want to take up too much of your time. No, it's but fine. It's, it's fine. fun. I'm trying to think of what else. Uh, so you're you're in Newport. I am. And yes. You, and you've lived there for a long time. I have. Yeah. Don't let that trail map of Park City throw you <laughs> off. <laughs> I thought that didn't look like Appalachians, but no, I, I'm not really. I don't have any kind of fake ship models to. Yeah. You know, this isn't a fake. This isn't a fake studio. I've lived here since a long time, but I, I when I returned from Northeastern University in 1992, I basically moved here, and I never left. Yeah, it's a cool town. I've I've often thought about, I mean, I love New England. I've lived mm. there a long time. And so I'm constantly feeling pulled back to New England. My is husband is a Marylander though, so it's a little, uh. <laughs> but I still love it. You know, I love that whole stretch between Block Island and Cuddy Hunk and, mm. and um, Tarpaulin Bay and just that whole, I love the Elizabeth Islands. I think they're amazing. And and then we have friends that we met actually in Georgetown that year who live up in Duxbury Bay. And mm -hmm. then others, uh, another set of friends um, who keep their boat in um, Paid and Aram. So I don't know. I think that New England boating, New England sailing is really special. Of course, Chesapeake Bay sailing is special too. But I always, every summer, I feel pulled to come up there. I just want to get, get to New England. And I don't know, maybe uh, maybe next year. <laughs> well, yeah. one of the things that I do is I'm kind of a weather geek. And so I, I check in a lot on, you know, like my favorite buoys. And one of my favorite buoys is the one at Buzzards Bay at the mouth. of. I mean, it always blows there. It's unbelievable. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's wonderful. Yeah. It funnels right there. What, what did um, Patrick Childress described? He called, always used to call it a Buzzards Bay snorter. Mm-hmm. You know, when when you get the current opposite the wind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That stiff southwest. Well, this has been fun. It's been fun talking to you. Thanks. All right. I appreciate you, you taking the time. It's very generous of you. And Yeah, it's nice. It's fun. It was good to talk with you. Hey, well, there you have it. That was my talk with Wendy Mittman-Clark. And as I mentioned in the intro, if you want to learn more about her, the best way is to visit her website. Uh, she's got links there, and you can read some of her previous publications. That website, again, is wendymittmanclark.com. That's W-E-N-D-Y-M-I-T-M-A-N-C-L-A-R-K-E dot com. And thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to Standing Before the Mass podcast with Chris Heaton, sponsored by Newport Nautical Supply. Please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.